So we got Connor. He's, yeah. He's a new Game of Thrones fan. He, let's say you hopped on the bandwagon. I for sure hopped on the bandwagon. But he also is the most researched Game of Thrones fan, staying up all hours of the night watching every YouTube lore. Yeah, as big as a fan you can get without the books yet. And all we're talking about is the movie here, or the shows. The shows, yeah. Basically yeah. the movie. Because I haven't read the books. Yeah. You haven't read the books? No. No, no. I haven't read it. First, I say we state the viewpoint we're coming from. So the two viewpoints I watch things are, one, a very casual fan. We've talked, Jim and I, in the past about movies in general and right. how I see entertainment. And I literally see it as, is it worth my hour of energy and attention? Yep. Yes or no. And right. that's basically, I want to be entertained for an hour. Now, obviously, I can rank things in my head. That was a better show than this show. Right. Worse movie than this movie. But that's how right. I come at it as a, as a casual fan. Now, as a content creator and businessman, I have a second view on most things I see. And I see, like, the like application, uh, intricacies, um, objectives, goals, and, like, big picture things. Mm -hmm. Kind of like whoever may be at the top desk of the HBO. Right. So I also see things from that nature. Like, why do they do that? Oh, well, because they couldn't afford to fly to Italy. You know, like, I understand why they did CGI in that scene mm -hmm. or something of that nature. I made all that up. But those are the two views I come at. So almost extremes. And right. that's kind of my whole life, really. I come from life as a businessman, entrepreneur, 30-year-old, <laughs> and like a five-year-old. <laughs> No, Connor is a creator himself, so he comes at things a little bit different. I think actually Jim and Connor come at things similar. I come at it from the standpoint that Game of Thrones is the biggest. No, 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 no. How do you see entertainment? You're, you're uh, already started hating. I you see haven't it. started hating. How do you come I see at it entertainment? As, I see it as uh, a show like Game of Thrones, like art. You look at entertainment as art and a production. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like literature to you in a way. Kind of, yeah. 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 Okay. So I I I'm with you on the literature thing, but I'm also with Mike on the the pragmatic like how do you get from point A to point B in the most popular and cost efficient way? Yeah. So I kind of I I see it on on both um both sides. And like I've said before too, I'm I often see movies and tv shows and stuff from the outside it's like what are the mechanics of it how are they telling the story why how are they using a particular character to accomplish cer a certain goal in storytelling almost see it as a writer or a director yeah yeah more more like that it's very difficult for me to get just deep into something and not have that whole layer of i'm watching a i'm watching an entertainment i'm watching a a version of a story. I mean, there are only so many stories, right? I mean, there are things that I do watch that are like that, but I have to like very uh, com compartmentalize them in my head where um, like Endgame or uh, any sort of Marvel movie, mm -hmm. like I just have to look at that as pure entertainment and like, uh -huh. kind of like fan service yeah. where something uh, more art housey, more like film, I guess you'd say. Uh, I have to look at that as, as like compartmentalize it into just art by itself. So I, I have just, a hard time like looking at it from like both aspects. Right. So I just watched um, John Wick 2 for the first time all the way through. Two, I had not this three. Two. I haven't seen three yet. But my experience with two was always every time I turned it on, it would be in the same spot. And I would see from that spot to the end, but I wouldn't see how they got to that to that point. But the craziest thing about John Wick, as far as I'm concerned, is the whole way opening a contract on somebody happens where you get on the phone and you call and the woman answers a freaking switchboard from the from the 50s and then types up an order for, you know, to kill somebody yeah, for X man. millions of dollars. And this other chick comes and gets the the order and puts it in a pneumatic tube and sends it off yeah, somewhere. Yeah. That's funny. And then people get the notifications on their flip phones from the 90s and it's so clearly artifice it is like this is a this is what this world looks like yeah 
our world doesn't work like that. So it just tells you this is not our world. You can't think yeah. that the rules of all our worlds apply to right. it. It's like the Matrix. Right, right, right. In a, no, in it a is. way. No, 100%. Uh, John Wick's literally the Matrix so got, 2019. Yeah, right. So you're, you're, you're immediately you have that distance. So you're, So then the first thing I'm thinking is, okay, what kind of story are they trying to tell and what are they trying to tell you about the characters and where is this going to end up? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which sadly with that show or movie probably ends up nowhere. Um, but it's so popular. It they is. just they just announced John Wick four, four because yeah. three opened so big. Yeah. But I, th- I and like openings are so weird in movies. Like I'm obviously not in the industry of only the lightest layer of dabbled in Hollywood. Um, but it's all dependent. Like the, all these records are dependent on what opens that weekend. Like nothing else opened yeah. this weekend. And Avengers is now three weeks old. Right, yeah. You so know what I mean? So, like, Avengers so of course, you're going to fucking smash some records, you know? Like, yeah. p- people break records, and, like, some movie broke records in February. What was it? But that's because no movie had been out for three months. Like yeah, our, I don't our, remember what it was. Our Christmas but... releases were kind of weak. Nothing in January. Nothing in February. Breaks all these records. Oh, it's the longest. It was, like, the longest standing for, like, eight weeks. I'm like, yeah, that's because there's no other fucking... Oh, uh, maybe even Captain Marvel. There's oh, other things. Something yeah, like that. Yeah, it's breaking all these records. Like, yeah. that's because there's no movie. Nothing, yet. yeah, there's no competition Detective at all. Pikachu. <laughs> that didn't do shit. <laughs> that flopped. I can't understand why anybody made that movie. It seems like such a mushroom. Well, it's a kids movie. Yeah, it's gonna. I end know, up, but yeah. why wouldn't they just do a Pokemon movie? I don't know. That it, just seems like I, just uh, someone who Reynolds did a bunch of yeah, but yeah, he could have been Pikachu and just did the fucking. I like, heard it's like, good. I heard it's all right, but I heard you're watching it and it feels like a kids movie, which is what I don't. I can't handle. I'm in that age where I can't handle that. Yeah. Like yeah. I can handle like a, a a kung fu panda where they like slipping in some adult jokes or whatever something like that, but I can't do like a bare bones. Yeah. yeah. So let's go around the the horn here. I know that that um, that when we get to Connor, he's going to be a hater. But like, what <laughs> <laughs> what did you like the best out of the finale and maybe the whole final season? Yeah, I think we should talk eight season eight of Game of Thrones. Um, in my head. Um, and everyone argues with me that Breaking Bad does it, but there's like never a movie or an ending to a book story that I'm always like, that was amazing. It couldn't have ended better. And so all these people are on Twitter crushing season eight, especially the finale. Yeah. And yeah, there's some clear, f- f- like actual fuck ups, like water bottles and Starbucks. And yeah. I, mean, I right. get that. Like it, Looks sloppy. They started making this two years ago. They could have taken care of that. One thousand percent. It, it's sloppy. And and how does it go through uh, every stagehand, pr- producer, director, yeah. every actor, and every editor? I don't know. And they can't roto that stuff out. Yeah. And one, how do they Before just not it. see it on set? There's got to yeah. be at least fifty people on set, minimum, yeah, yeah, yeah. with makeup yeah. artists, and someone's got to speak up. Um, sure, sloppy production, uh, especially considering the amount of money in there. You know, Cersei's making a million plus an episode. She's hardly. In I get it. Yeah, the final not at episode. All. Yeah, uh, so I get all that. Um, but all these people on Twitter again, they're coming as a casual fan. This is where my issues come, and I don't want to speak for everyone on Twitter, obviously. But the majority of people watch this as a casual fan. Mm-hmm. The majority of people have never made a movie. Mm-hmm. <laughs> the majority of people haven't even made a YouTube video. Mm-hmm. The majority of people have never been in theater. Mm-hmm. The majority of people have never acted. I've done all these things besides the big screen movie, mm-hmm. uh, and I still come as a casual fan. And they're out there bitching and running their fucking gums on the internet like they could write a better story or do mm-hmm. a better job. And that's, I think, what pisses me off, right? Uh, if you can come at me and write the most detailed, perfect character arc to end this thing. What? There's three options, right? Like, fucking, hey, spoilers. Uh, turn this thing off if you guys haven't watched it or don't want it. Things are coming. Uh, John's going to be on the throne. Daenerys is going to be on the throne. What what are other options, right? So actually, like they kind of threw a twist. Tyrion, yeah, they, Sensa, Sensa, maybe because she's like a, a chick and kind of married Tyrion and kind of married all these kings. Uh, I don't know, <laughs> you know, who knows? Uh, there's no other option. And then uh, people have to disperse in a story. It happens the same at the end of Lord of the Rings. He's, in fact, it's just, it's a direct copy of the end of the Lord of the Rings right. movies, right? And yeah. which 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 when you watch it, I always get a weird feeling when I watch the end of Lord of the Rings, like. Mm. Right? Uh, well, it's settled. Yeah, I it's haven't sad. seen Lord of the End of Lord of the Rings in so long that I don't remember what Well, it's the same thing. Well, it <laughs> ends like four times. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Everyone kind of disperses, and then you kind of tell a story again, and then it disperses, and then it kind of tells a story yeah, again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Kind of like this, yeah. where like they kind of like the like kind of happens. Like They could have ended it r- right when John killed uh, Daenerys. Uh, like, 
they could have just ended it there and let let that imagination go, which would have yeah. been fine too. And maybe that's what the internet wanted. But the point is, if they're going to tell the story and tell the finish, no one's going to be happy. Yeah. So back to the original question: What did you like best? Uh, what I liked best, none of it really. Like none of it like stood out. Like I loved it. Um, I think the battle was cool. I actually think the character arc itself was actually more on par than people are saying. That's mm. what people's biggest argument is that people didn't obviously. For those that don't know, like uh, the character didn't act in the environment like they would have based on the seven season buildup of that character. Mm. That's what basically people are arguing is that take so-and-so character and everything we know about them you place them in this situation they're not acting accordingly and i actually disagree i think the majority of the time they are um um i like Daener- i like daenerys blowing up the fucking city like she's blown up a lot of cities in her past like she's fucking angry from season one she's kind of angry um mm-hmm. and she's never been she's always ruled kind of machiavellian uh, her, her, and, and Machiavellian, it's all about perspective. All these things are about perspective. If you think you're the innocent, um, she's not a Mother Teresa. Mm-hmm. She rules with a hard hand. Uh, you fuck me up, I kill you. I don't know how to make this not happen. Go on, Connor. Okay, I stop. Okay. I'll, go, I'll, I'll catch up on the rest of So I actually kind of like the, the character arc. Uh, I think she acts in a way that is normal. I think Jon Snow's ending is kind of like actual beautiful. Uh, like where, where was he like most comfortable and normal? Like his first love, like who did he actually first unite first mm-hmm. all in the wildlings. So he ends yeah. up out there. makes sense to me. And he also killed a queen. So you kill a queen. What are you going to do? You die or you go to the wall and now the wall is useless, but he went to the wall like that. It all makes sense. Really? I have a, I have a quibble with that, but, but let's move forward. <laughs> what did you like best Connor? Uh, the, of season eight, the, Thing or that the, I like or the, the most. finale, or yeah. Either uh, I'm going season eight, and that is just the pure fight scenes that that were directed. Um, just c- like not counting logistics at all, uh-huh. just the way they were they looked, and it was yeah, yeah. it was shot nice. Yeah, there's some really pretty shots. Yeah, um, I think that's one thing they actually did do really good, even though like people complained about the lighting in the third episode or whatever. Yeah. I think I think it looked really cool. by a better TV, you fucking bum. Well, yeah. I watched that one on the internet. Um, I watched it on HBO. Now, um, a couple of days, no, no, same time. No, actually, I I watched it a week late on HBO Now. That's what it was when I was in um, uh, Portland, Maine. The Airbnb happened to have it. I didn't have any idea. I watched it and it looked fine to me. We just had to think the the streaming version did not look the same as the, the HBO feed version. We had HBO Go, and I think that's streaming. Yeah, I don't yeah, know, but is. we just had to make some adjustments on my TV. It yeah, no, fine. I didn't have. Any it was dark, stuff. but like that's like part of the tone too. And I guess yeah. obviously it's an extreme if you can't see shit. Um, but it's part of the tone. Yeah, winter's it, fucking coming. They say that for six seasons, and now you're gonna bitch that winter's here. Like, yeah, that's part of the. It's, and it's dark in the winter. Yeah, <laughs> and the, I don't think people are bitching about that. I think it's more of like the amount of time that everything happened in. No, for sure. It no, no, no. But people, so no, rushed. No, so that's compressed. next topic. That's next okay. topic. Yeah, yeah. So but you were talking about the dark scene. Yeah. And people did complain about the dark scene. Yeah. But then uh, that's hypocritical because they're complaining about not setting the tone and character arc. The whole character arc is that this Winter King is literally like a devil type thing bringing environment zombies. And now he's at war. He's brought the darkness. Yeah. So don't bitch about the dark scene. I had no quarrels with the dark scene. No, I'm not saying you. People. <laughs> I'm talking. I'm arguing them. with Twitter. But but as a as a camera person as a visual person, what did you think of the shot in in the final episode where Daenerys is walking through that archway and Drogon is behind her with the wings? The the internet is split on this. Oh, really? They say I liked it's it. either amazing or it's the cheesiest thing ever. I I thought it was super cheesy just because <laughs> the CGI behind it didn't look um like that realistic. Yeah, or like you could kind of see where she was cut out and where like the green screen. It was all green screen, but right where uh, it just didn't look that great to me for whatever. I, I wish they did it in um, where the, it was like there was some sort of actual castle, but I know like that yeah. cost a lot of money yeah. to like have a castle yeah. built or whatever. Yeah. So the thing I really liked the best was uh, uh, Tyrion in the final episode. Now, not everything he says makes sense no. for sure. But if you're going to use one character to try to draw everything together, for sure, it's got to be him. Yeah, it it has to be him. And and uh, yeah, he created democracy. Essentially, <laughs> yeah, it, it, uh, yeah, he, he created a um, 
kind of a not, I don't know, constitutional democracy sure. or something like that. Yeah, where, yeah. but if you think about it, like some some things about what he did make it a lot of sense because uh, Cersei did not have any right to be queen. She right. declared herself queen, of course. So it's already been like the tradition's already been broken. You can do whatever you want from yeah. that po- point forward. It was a little irritating when. Um, uh, Samuel Tarley suggested that they ask the people and everyone was like, ha, 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 no, there's no way to do that. So what did you like the least, Mike? Um, yeah, I guess uh, going to my business hat is I understand what I like the least. Uh, obviously, um, at some point, communication comes with money, HBO production uh, that the show's ending, and they have to cram a lot into a little. Uh, yeah. And so the whole thing does feel rushed um what they do really an amazing job of season basically one through six is making every conversation matter to the utmost so you get if you're not paying attention you miss one blurb one comment in a hallway one speech one gesture from Tyrion. you you could miss a whole like storyline um which is really amazing uh they 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 make it compact but it's so full it's really full and this season wasn't so full it was more um rushed and splattered um and so like again you know everyone's complaints are obviously probably the same that i dislike but i just take it as it is right like we build eight seasons and the battle's one episode um Right, you build eight seasons and how Cersei dies. Mm-hmm. And some people are complaining, and I get it, but like, you can't really draw out some of those things either. Because right. because if they would have made the Battle of uh, Winter or whatever the hell they're calling Winter. it, the Darkness, the fucking King Winter, Win- Winterfell, <laughs> the the Battle of Winterfell. No, the other. Oh. yeah, is that what they're calling it? Yeah, yeah, sure. Mm-hmm. If they if they make that five episodes, people are gonna bitch also. Yeah, it's um, gonna be too much. Right. So like, where does that lie? That's why I take it as it is, and I thought it was okay. Um, but yeah, probably overall, uh, how much they tried to... Th- what they did is they, they rushed and crammed things, but they didn't do much with yeah. it. Um, there's like a million sayings in basketball for stuff like that. But like, uh, yeah, you're moving a lot, but you're going nowhere, right? Yeah, I would say that's probably true. Yeah, it seemed like for me, it was just a bunch of sloppy writing where uh, the directors and producers of the show didn't have any source material to go off. Um, which I think plays a huge role because you have nothing to kind of base uh, a career long of writing that George R. R. Martin mm-hmm. does. Well, now it's someone else's brain. Yeah, yeah. And they're just, they don't have the same uh, level of skill of writing that George R. R. Martin does. Well, I read a thing last week or the week before, and I'm not going to remember the guy's name, but I'll put it in the show notes. Uh, it was a, I'm sure it's an article somewhere, but it was a, a Twitter um, string about different writing styles Mm -hmm. uh the (laughs) plotters versus pantsers plotters figure out what the whole story arc is and then they color in the character details pantsers right from the seat of their pants so they basically the characters tell them where the plot's going and george R. r martin is kind of the ultimate pantser which is how there are like 31 different points of view in the books and it's impossible to for somebody else to step in and actually like make sense of all that and pay, make all those things pay off. Um, I think that they were just trying to get to the end points yeah. as efficiently as possible. I don't have any p- real problems with the end points. No, neither do I. It's just the way they got there, especially that like there's a whole scene missing in the final episode, as far as I'm concerned, between John killing Daenerys. And that that council, yeah, 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 of of lords they or whatever, have, yeah, yeah, they have fifty minutes. Yeah, like yeah. what 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 happened in between there? Like when did the when did the uh, um, the unsullied find him and put him in jail? Yeah, I mean, what did he tell them? Did he confess? Right. Her body is gone. He right. could have said anything. Yeah. He probably should have said anything. Yeah. It might have all fallen apart. Maybe somebody was watching. I don't know. There's a whole big piece there that they just went up. Oh, we're, yeah, gonna yeah. Go f- we're gonna go past that. That was that was a big issue for me. Another big issue for me was when Tyrion got down to uh, where Jamie and and Cersei were buried in rubble. Mm-hmm. 
there was a lot of open space there they could have stepped in, stepped into. I mean, twenty feet in another yeah. direction, and they would have survived. There was no crumble. Yeah. 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 They just like move. Like it's starting to fall here. Move over there. <laughs> Get under the arch. This is like you know earthquake territory in California. He was, he was just fucked move. up already though, and she was trying to carry him. Yeah, he would probably have already been dead. Yeah, because he was. Stabbed, but I'm just but saying, like she's carrying him out of there. Yeah, basically. Yeah, I don't know. It just so they're moving slow. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so, that's just like a minor like production detail that they could have just added more rubble around on the on the bottom of uh, yeah on the sides whatever the, the crypts whatever they want to call that. Uh, another one that people have trouble with that I don't have trouble with is the fact that <laughs> it's this one right here. So Bran gets to be king despite the fact he just put his name on the group project and yeah. didn't do any work. That, she's just looking for Twitter retweets. Yeah, yeah. and the uh, um and a lot of people did too. And the the fact that he said, "Oh, I don't want to be Lord of of Winterfell." Because it would have been him, and that's why it ended up being Sansa. But he knew that it needed to be Sansa. When and he might have known that he was going to be king if things worked out right. right. I mean, exactly. that's, that's the argument for everything. Exactly. And he's, and the he's, argument of, of not being there, like, the same argument goes everywhere. Like, Joffrey, fucking every king yeah. ever. Like, even you can argue that in real life with politicians. Like, what have you really accomplished to get what you were at? Sometimes it's just money and who your family is. Like, that's not an argument. Is there any character in Game of Thrones that's less redeemable than Joffrey? Uh, they're, they're, uh, I, I can't think of one. some of my buddies shout out to david so uh he's obviously a comedian uh and he's i follow uh, we follow each other on twitter obviously and he i was following his path as he just started watching game of thrones and he's bitching about every episode as a comedian would kind of right. like these tweets right. and so like you take it with a grain of salt he's critical he's a super intelligent guy but he's also obviously uh, also just trying to entertain on Twitter. Um, but he hates fucking Sam. Like he hates everybody. Like he's just fucking <laughs> crushing people. He hates Bran. Like he's just fucking crushing people all day. Uh, Sam, I, I like Sam because uh, I like his heart. Uh, but he's pretty fucking shitty too, to be honest. There's a lot of shitty characters that like, but they, they make you uh, like them or not dislike them. That's what right, Game yeah, of Thrones they, does well. Is they they make, stack the deck for a character. Cersei yeah. fucking sucks. Uh, I, I I really don't like Cersei. Um but yeah, they make you they make you have an opinion on every character. But even is, she's more redeemable than, than yeah. Joffrey's Joffrey. a little kind. Joffrey yeah. was was just an extreme mm-hmm. character. Yeah. Even uh, Cersei is wasn't redeemable. Oh, like her at the end, she like when she was like crying at the end um, yeah. before she gets yeah. I didn't really have trampled by rocks. Yeah, you're just like oh, like yeah. you should have died however long. Or ago. you should have just made a deal. You had 20, uh, 20 different paths that you could have done something yeah. better and you're still just showed you're a piece of shit. Yeah. You don't care about your kid. You don't care about nobody. Uh, just because of, of life situations, th- the whole like crying over something doesn't really get very far with me <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. anymore. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, which brings us around to, to my other question is this. Like when you're, th- when you're thinking about the course of your own life, like how much time do you spend thinking about how your story works? Like how I fit in my story? How you fit in your yeah. story, what your story arc is, like what end point you're looking for, and then uh, this is the B part of the question, then how much do you think about how other people perceive your story? I mean, we're we're kind of in the public, sort yeah, yeah. of, in, in a way, maybe more than we really want to say. Yeah, but. yeah. Yeah, I think uh, it's me thinking about other people thinking about my story. I probably should think about more, and I know that sounds... Um, you know, heavenly and like how everyone says like, oh yeah, right. You're thinking about everybody and every, like I think about YouTube comments, obviously, but those pass pretty quick within 24 hours of whether they make me happy or sad. Um, and so like acutely really quick or like I, uh, I think of a lot of, uh, other people's opinions. Uh, Long term stroke, I never have once thought about someone's opinion on me. Like, why is Mike, you know, like, luckily I have a supportive mom and yeah. that's like my only family. And so, like, I've never thought a long stroke, Mike's path is dumb or Mike's path is great or Mike should have done more or Mike should have done less or whatever. Mm-hmm. I never think of any of that. Um, but I think of my own uh, insane amount. And whether you want to call my belief spiritual law of attraction, visualization, whatever label you want to put on it, it's a huge part of who I am and what I do. I think about um, where I want to be, what it looks like half of that time, what it looks like a quarter of that time, and mm-hmm. whether you want to call it breaking up goals, if you want to be right, the, right. the systematic guy or if you want to be the you know philosophical guy and think about it as the law of attraction and visualization, whatever it is. I think about it all the time, and I don't think about it as romantically as a Game of Thrones mm-hmm. story does. Uh, I think about it more as the life I want to live, what I see my future looking like, and how the hell do I get there step by step, day by day. Yeah. yeah. Connor? That was great. <laughs> <laughs> um, Sorry you have to follow that. 
I don't look at my life as like one big story arc. I kind of look at the end and then um, how I want to get there. Whether I think about that day to day, I probably should um, because it would dictate more decisions like that I shouldn't just randomly play video games (laughs) for like three hours and I should (laughs) be getting better at my craft or like reading or whatever. Yeah. Um, But... I'd like to think that I think, uh, like I see the end goal of what Mm -hmm. I want to do and then that just dictates uh, a lot of decisions in my life. Mm -hmm. For me, kind of every time options come up, my mind runs on what the story would look like, you know? Like how does What's that, this path lead to? Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where does this Where does this path path lead, and what What kind of impact does that have? Yeah. And and um, uh, in terms of other people's perception, I'm susceptible to that, uh, just like anybody else would be I'm, who is sort of in the public at all. I'm not at all. I don't know why. Yeah. Yeah, it's a good thing. Like I said, I don't think I am long term, but short term, I definitely am. Like, yeah. what are people going to think of this outfit? Or what do people think about yeah. this video I just posted? I just don't think about, like, broad stroke, even a year. What has Mike done this year? He wasted it. I don't give a fuck what people think about that. Yeah. Because I know I'm on my path. Well, because people don't understand. That too, especially it, it, you know, and, and in and terms of like, for, listeners. For us, our situation has changed over the last couple of years. Yeah. And people in their minds thought things were going to be a particular way yeah. or stay a particular way for a long time. And that was really never going to happen. Right. It was. Ne- right. It was that was really never on the on the boards. Yeah. It might have, you know, continued for longer than it did, but it was never on the boards that that was the end goal. Right, right, right. But everybody has a has a place in their head for how things are supposed to be because they have short term vision. You have short term vision when you see somebody else's story, yeah. and hopefully you have long term vision when you see your own. And that's just how it goes, right? You never look at like the most typical one you never look at like Kobe Bryant winning five rings or whatever mm-hmm. and you see you don't see every free throw he ever shot for the last 30 years mm-hmm. right you just see him dunking the ball to win the game at the end right you have short term vision of that and you have short term oh my god he's going on a yacht next week in Disneyland and living the dream you don't see oh my god he has to retire next year how sad is he going to be what is he going to do with his personality his persona his identity he's lost now because he has to retire like you don't see forward and backward of them you see six months of a human story and so that's what you and i went through and, and many people do you right. just especially again because we put our lives on the internet a little bit yeah. yeah but people just see they see like oh bad decision but they don't see long term like uh, people change jobs they change businesses they start new projects they end new projects all the time yeah. especially in 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 entertainment right. where we don't i mean we we're in the fitness industry but we're in, in entertainment yeah that's yeah. really that's our public face is is an entertainment based thing and yeah 100 yeah so and if you're that invested <clears throat> into like all these other people's lives like you're gonna have no time to right that's exactly Look at your own true. story. Yeah, that's yeah. exactly true, and I think that's a lot of the the reaction to Game of Thrones. People wanted it to play out a particular way for themselves. Yeah, they to to match their vision of how it was supposed to go. Um, but how often in when you actually just observing other people's lives, is there a big change that you didn't expect, or there's a thing that happens that doesn't really have any great logic to it? It just happens. Yeah, yeah. You know, shit falls out of the sky. Yeah, yeah. Right. Pregnancies, marriage, yeah. fall in love, move across the country, right. new job, anything. Yeah, and thing and things end. And those don't always fit a fucking personality or story arc either. No, because that's the th- something we see in a movie, especially uh, or TV show. You know, especially this one, like. Like the, it's like they do a good job of obviously they film every year, every other year so mm-hmm. that the characters actually age because they right. have a bunch of kids in this thing. So you're actually following their, these kids started at, you know, 16. Yeah. Arya is like 16. Now she's 24 or whatever. Right. Um, I think she was 12. Yeah. Something. Yeah. Something. Yeah, something whatever. Really and now she's like 22. Yeah. Whatever yeah. the arc is. But, uh, people change yeah so like just because someone is like quiet and in their steady job and in real life or a movie Mm -hmm. uh, particularly in real life the personality connor wouldn't do that connor would more do this connor acts this way connor and one day the motherfucker shows up nose ring he's fucking filming you know or whatever you know then you're like oh yeah like that's different like that's how humans work or like the guy has the same job for 15 years and then something happens at work new boss new you don't know that part or just doesn't want to do it and just gets a new job just goes right. back to college, just decides to move, just moves to Mexico, just goes on vacation. Like that's how life works. And so like, obviously we're talking about a story versus real life and people want the story to mm-hmm. match up perfectly. But even if we wrote down, it, which they do a great job, every attribute of who Arya is and who Jon mm-hmm. Snow is, like how they act or not, who knows? You know, like it's not very, on, like Jon Snow is pretty honorable because of Ned Stark and all those things through six seasons, maybe even seven. And they just stabs 
someone. And you could say it's honorable because he's trying to stop this grand massacre. But the honorable thing would probably be to rally other people, arrest her, and put her on trial, right? If you're thinking honorably. Like, that's Mm -hmm. not against it. But I don't think a lot of people had an issue with that because it made sense. Right. Right? Like, it doesn't fit character, but it makes sense. And that's kind of how life works. Like. People just do shit sometimes. Yeah, and that actually comes back around to how uh, Jamie Lannister could have killed, been the Kingslayer. J- Jamie could have done so much. But he was still, uh, because he killed um, Daenerys' father. Yeah. But he was still part of the structure of, of ruling the Seven Kingdoms. Actually, Jamie like, might be one of my favorite parts of the last two seasons. Yeah. Because he, like, he sh- looks more human in the last couple seasons rather than like just Cersei's bitch. Uh, or just like a Lannister like yeah, he was yeah. a fucking Lannister and like Cersei's bitch for a long time and yeah. at the end like you kind of see that he's more human the Brie uh, the Brie mm-hmm. stuff the Sansa stuff like the head in the Winterfell to start mm-hmm. to fight the the, the, the zombies coming mm-hmm. like all that made me like him a little bit more and and I just like which Game of Thrones does very well through the whole thing and I forgot if it's seven or eight I think it's eight um, where you don't you don't know who team Jamie's on for a sec yeah, like, right. you know, like that's what Game of Thrones. That's what people wanted at the ending. That's what people love about Game of Thrones right. is the the it's reasonable, but you're unsure. Yeah, and that's the whole m- series in like a nutshell. Uh, so I think I like Jamie a lot in the A season. Going back to what's some of my favorites. I uh, wish yeah. they would have made it into like multiple like this season eight and into yeah. just multiple seasons because then we could have seen like a reasonable time um, change from oh I love Brienne for and sure I want to be with her to like overnight just oh, I'm going to go back to Cersei and yeah he loved her for three seasons and he turned her into a one night stand yeah yeah for sure but but again that's where my production businessman hat goes on like someone cut the cord I yeah. don't know if it's HBO or the producers the producers right? is my, my but, understanding but the, the yeah. cord was cut a date was set episodes and budget mm-hmm. were set and so like you got to get an ending how do we get there you know how do we get there efficiently as they could well and, I don't mm. think you can beat it. Like yeah. I, that's why I'm saying to all these Twitter people, like you have this much money and you have six episodes. G- give me what you got, yeah. and you can't beat it. Like from a pragmatic standpoint, you know. So those producers are going on to produce the next Star Wars yeah. series. Yeah. So like, do you have high hopes going? So I don't. I have like very little hopes now. I'm concerned, but I'm concerned about the whole Star Wars franchise. What's happen- I don't think anybody knows how to do what it. What are they actually producing? Like episode the, 10, 11, 12? Uh, no. A series. New, new, uh, no. Yeah, I, th- I thought they were doing the next three movies. I thought it was a series. I, th- or, I think it's. I don't know. Is it Netflix or the Disney Plus movies? No. Uh, Real maybe. movies. I don't know. That's what I mean. There's so many know. things. So it depends. Yeah. Again, like you, I think that these guys are producers and fans. I think that's the story, right? They are fans of Game of Thrones they're not writers yeah and so yeah. like that's obviously the if you just stamp the issue with yeah. season eight that's the issue with season eight so if they're going on and writing like using some of george lucas stuff or if they have a star wars writer with them yeah i'm excited yeah yeah they just can't do it, it alone yeah. like how they did the last right but which is yeah. nobody though and we shouldn't expect them to either and if you're thinking from like a business point or if you're like a real fan of these things and not like mm-hmm. a, a, a a a layer fan to me a layer fan just says like this sucked i hate it nah. Game yeah. of Thrones sucks. But like if you're a real fan, like I feel like you have empathy for those guys too. Yeah. Like those guys are getting lashed right now when they like they didn't want to fuck it up. Yeah. But they, all this thing's dumped on their head, right? Mm-hmm. The cords pulled from whoever's angle, the budget set from whoever angle, who I don't know all that business stuff, mm-hmm. and they did the best they could with it. Like that's like going to you, like, Connor, I'm out for a week, bro. Like uh you actually have to film yourself doing the squat tutorial now. Yeah. And like it might not come out the best because you've never done a squat tutorial, but like And filming yourself is hard. Yeah, yeah, yeah beside the point. <laughs> uh but but people shouldn't you for that because like you did your best for the channel that's kind of like uh, the exact analogy yeah but um, you could go like when you're at that level and have that resources and you have your name established those two writers could have the producers and writers could have reached out to anyone and got i don't know help. i don't know because you have the, like they Lawrence. set this kasdan they set this budget they set a timeline like the season had the, the timeline for the season was out probably five years ago like season eight's dropping you know march ish kind of yeah. you know what i mean like yeah. you think you have time like they're filming uh the fight scene they the, had to know that it was uh under expectations maybe maybe the, the battle itself i heard took 55 days to shoot yeah, yeah. that's that's so totally they shot possible. this season and who knows how many years who you know what i mean like yeah, yeah. it it's sounds two years. it sounds great to be able to go and sit down with uh the the uh original author's name for a year and learn everything from them before you write season eight but like again from a business standpoint it's probably just not doable 
Probably yeah. not. Same thing with our analogy. Like, you would think that they have enough power to be like, okay, like we need another year. We need another two I don't years. think so. No, it doesn't work that way because well, they HBO, took another year. Though, I mean, HBO, the I mean, they want the series to do good. And it did good from HBO's standpoint. Business. Uh, they I, broke I every record last regret, night. I, I think they're going to regret the uh, the amount of back. I think right I now th- they're... I don't think HBO. But but that's just like how it goes because you got to think about the multiple layers of business from actor to director to producer to writer, wherever that lies, to actual like money coming from HBO and money coming from who else. It's So it's the same example as me and you putting out three YouTube videos a week. I'm out of town next week. You got to get three YouTube videos out. Could you go and mentor with Omar for a month? You ain't got time. We got to get that video out. <laughs> but you have the resources. Like, if you really asked me, like, Mike, I want to learn more about squats. Can I go fly up to Omar? I might help you. Yeah. But we ain't got time. You got to get the video out. Yeah. I, I think then there's one other thing that, that was at play here that people don't really talk about. They say, oh, HBO is willing to go out to 10 seasons or more. That was HBO before that acquisition. And now they're owned by somebody else. Uh, yeah, see, there's yeah. so much and, business involved. And I yeah. think that they were probably afraid, the way I would be afraid, just regardless of contracts, that you'd be in a situation where you were canceled and you would be at a certain point in your story arc and you couldn't finish correctly anyway. Yeah, and how many And you would still episodes, have to rush it. How many series fizzle out? Um, Plenty like, of them. Like, Sein, not Seinfeld, but something, right? And it's going for 10 years, like, we're fucking killing it. Sign another 10-year contract yeah, and then no one's watching it. Walking yeah. Dead is, is yeah. trailing downward very quickly. <laughs> Uh, yet it's still because it started off so popular, it's more popular than um, than most everything else on cable. So they, it keeps going. Right. But is the storytelling great at this point, or yeah. is it interesting at this point? Yeah. It's it just has some, the name. There's just so yeah, much the name. business it's a with all this. Yeah, it's a franchise. All right. Um, I did see a YouTube video, which I want to bring up. Yeah. Go ahead. Talking about these Twitters, and I don't watch a lot of it, but Connor. Uh, manages my YouTube channel and helps us here at Fifty Percent Facts. So what he watches on YouTube, I see, or I get recommended based <laughs> right. on what he watches. And he's been watching all these Game of Thrones things. So something popped up about, uh, and it was highly edited and clipped. So uh-huh. who knows what the full conversation went like? But it was different interviews of the actors asking, mm. uh, this. yeah, what they thought of oh, yeah. uh, the finale. Yeah, and like all the uh, responses are so sad. Like. Uh, one like it seems like uh, I don't know uh, entertainment television or something yeah. interview I don't know what it was we were talking to Jon Snow uh, or whatever the actor's name is and uh, Kate Harrison what uh, would you one word one word before you go the season finale just one word and he's like thinking and he's like disappointment <laughs> and then like fucking cut screen so who knows if he said something else yeah uh, he, he kind of like laughed after it yeah um, and they, they might have you know like he might have tried to explain himself like yeah. maybe he was jokingly disappointed yeah. that he wasn't on the cr- the throne or something like who yeah. knows where it went because it's so edited but there's a million shots they're talking to gray worm they're talking about everybody like that and they're getting crushed all the actors kind of seem to knew, know that uh, it wasn't up to the quality that yeah. the previous six but, well, and, um, um, Amelia Clark? Yeah. 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 She was super upset of with the turn, the heel turn. Yeah. At the at the end. Well, because that just, also determines their career too. Yeah. Potentially. She's like, people please don't call me the Mad Queen. She said that when she read the script, she just cried. And then yeah, she had to go that. take a walk around London, and then she had to call her friends and family and say, "I can't tell you why I'm upset. I just need you to be really supportive right now." And I, I can see that she loved the character, but the character was was highly flawed and was probably going to end up there, but probably needed three, four, or five more episodes yeah. to get there. It's yeah. pretty you know? human for her to be fucked up. Yeah, yeah. Considering what Arya went through. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Be a little angry. Or Daenerys. Daenerys. Yeah. Oh yeah. Sorry. Yeah, both Maisie, of them. Maisie. Oh, yeah. yeah. And now, now uh, Arya's they they call her Dora the Explorer on Twitter, <laughs> <laughs> uh, which I don't think is that bad. Me and Connor were talking about it last year. I, I like, of course, it sucks to see like many people's favorite character just disappear on a boat heading west to who knows where. Um, but again, that is kind of Lord of the Rings esque. That's like a lot of endings, and like I do think it fits her story. Like she's always been like a, a solo writer since since she escaped since, when her dad died. Right. Yeah. yeah she's yeah. literally been on her own. Yeah, this is actually my favorite meme. I got 99 problems, but a bitch ain't 100. No, I now have 100 problems. <laughs> yeah, there are funny memes. Even uh, Maisie, whatever, what was on Twitter and said, like, yo, I'm just here for the memes. <laughs> she <laughs> yeah, tweeted sure. that out, yeah. All right, uh, this seems pretty good. We're going to uh, take a small break here, and then we're going to pick up with Michael Fay, who's going to tell us for a few minutes about uh, storytelling and character arcs in documentaries. We just watched your film, actually. Now I got a pit bull tattoo on my butt. 
that's how it starts. <laughs> I want to lift weights like Dave Tate. You mean with you know, shake a lot? Yeah, having yeah. a nervous <laughs> having a nervous breakdown into the bar every time. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so we just we just spent a little while um, uh, talking about the G- Game of Thrones finale and also mm-hmm. uh, just kind of personal storytelling as well. Like like when we think about our lives, do we think about the story of our life, the arc of our uh, of the story of our life, and how people perceive that? Because that usually uh-huh. is very often doesn't happen quite the the way that we expect. And then your situation when when you made um, uh, West Side versus the World, you were telling Louis's story and the right. story of the gym at the same time. But the gym is still there, and Louis is not dead. How do you end it? Mm-hmm. And and I know that there there's things about the timing that affected the ending itself. So just give us your perspective on where you were trying to land it and where you did land it and uh, how you felt about all that. Um, well, the biggest thing was that, you know, the, the story wasn't going in. There was what you know, or, or rather what I knew about West Side going in. Yeah. Um, which I had heard a lot of stories through the years from guys like Dave Tate and stuff. And obviously from my dad's interest in the gym Um, but getting there, I guess I didn't really have any clear sort of concept of what, where the gym was or what it was in the time period in which I got there around like 2015, 2016. Uh Um, you know, so it was, I don't know what I had imagined in my head. I guess I thought that there would be some sort of a, a clear kind of out point, um, or some sort of clear direction in which it was going. Um, and honestly, like the, the lifters who I thought were going to be sort of the core of the gym at the time. I mean, Hoff was, he was pretty banged up. He wasn't really lifting big weights at the time. Laura Phelps had kind of just hung it up. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, there's no sort of like news service or anything that tells you what the state of the gym is. And that's always um, been the case with West Side. It's always been pretty it's been pretty tight. You don't get a whole lot of information out of West Side ever. Yeah. Uh even when you're there, you don't get a whole <laughs> lot of information. Uh, <laughs> even among the people who are there, you don't uh, get a whole lot of information. It seemed like Yeah, it's, well, it seemed like they didn't always have a whole lot of information. Yeah. Um everyone's kind of just got their head down and is really concentrating on just making it through sort of their path and their journey. Um, But so some things kind of eventually I kind of got a sense of where like Louie was Mm -hmm. um, in terms of sort of his perspective on his guys and his life at the time. Um, And he went from being kind of very upset with, with the state of his gym to, varying degrees of somewhat pleased. Um, And then, you know, uh, around the end, sort of because our time frame got so screwed up um, with the the shenanigans around the movie and the the behind the scenes with us, that it allowed for enough time for, you know, say, among other things, for Hoff to kind of uh, get back lifting again and get back healthy again. Um, and then some other guys kind of, uh, you know, Jason Coker had a couple good years there and uh, Wes McCormick was doing well. And they had Chris Spiegel and, uh, you know, doing some big raw numbers. So there there kind of was a little bit of a moment. And then, um, you know, the, the things that transpired with one of the sort of legendary lifters coming back to the gym. Right. Um. I guess trying not to give that away too much, but uh, <laughs> watch the movie towards the end. Yeah. Something happens. Something happens. Um, there's a, there's a twist at the end. Yeah. And there was, there were a couple, there were a couple characters who kind of just all sort of in unison. I started to notice their sort of individual stories kind of settling all around the same time. And of course, moving forward, none of those people's stories remain stagnant. So anytime you choose an ending, you know, you are, you are kind of just arbitrarily choosing a point 
right where you have to land the plane um i mean most often it just means that you know once the cameras stop rolling the plane refuels and takes off and goes somewhere else right so as you began began to know the characters involved and and the thing that i that I always had trouble with in terms of trying to make anything about powerlifting is that you just don't know what the outcomes are going to be. You can't follow somebody leaning into a meet and expecting the end to be triumphant because it often isn't, particularly in the geared lifting world. Uh, was there a point where you just had to dismay about, about how it was all going to come together? Or was the fact that you kind of set the meat of the movie in the earlier years kind of your, your safety net? Um, you really just have to kind of be adaptive. Um, I mean, again, going in, I already knew a lot about the earlier years. Yeah. So that was, I mean, that was sort of the story that I had been sold on going in. Um, then, you know, there was sort of the more human elements of kind of everything that had happened in the last 10 years or so. Um, and really the, the end of the movie, which is the, you know, the, the strongest part of the movie and the, the sort of most organic. Right. Um, and those were, that was all sort of born out of watching, you know, what was just happening in front of me with, with Louie and his reactions to everything. And then, you know, with everyone else's kind of, uh, you know, reflections on either what had happened long ago and weighing, you know, was it all worth it? Or with the younger guys and the people who were still in it, um, seeing where they kind of felt and where things were going. So when you'd heard these stories before, you had things in your mind about, okay, this is the this is the arc of this story. This is how it worked out. And then you started doing interviews. Were there times when you got vastly different stories from people than what you'd heard and you, th- and you were like, oh... Damn, <laughs> that's not nearly as good um, as I was hoping it was going to be. Uh, I mean, usually when something like that happens, um, it's more a matter of the person doesn't really trust you. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you're really having to pry that sort of better story out of them. I mean, eventually, if you interview enough people, you kind of get a sense of, you know, when is someone... When is someone really like rushing through the beats of their story? When is someone minimalizing something that's happened in their life? When are they trying to just conceal it? Um, you see that a lot with with people. Um, you know, you ask them to tell you a story once, and they might sum up a huge life changing event in you know two sentences, uh-huh. and then you kind of have to you know a lot of times you circle back to it and you ask, you know, okay, now at this very precise moment within that story, what did you feel? Uh, Cause it's easy, you know, you can write it down on paper, say in a number of different ways, you know, these power lifters power lifted. Well, that's not <laughs> interesting. No, you know, these, these crazy power lifters. Yeah. These crazy power lifters power lifted crazily. And it, it gives you more of a sense, but really the the most interesting thing at least for me becomes when you take something that um becomes very extreme and uh, almost surreal and then you kind of pull it back in and find like what are the really relatable human elements in it because you never you know you never really expect that you know if you're watching these power lifters you see these crazy things that they do and the crazy things that they're you know, in terms of the weights that they lift, you know, the the things that are shocking and, and hard, you know, just numbers that are hard to comprehend. But then you go back and you start to think about, you know, well, this isn't forever for them. And, you know, what does this mean for the rest of their life? Mm. And, um, yeah, I don't know how to really explain it other than you just kind of get a get a sense for it. And after a while, you start to notice that everyone's sort of stories and um, variations and versions of the events, that they all kind of rest in similar spots. Mm -hmm. How much daylight do you think there is between 
you know, narrative storytelling in a, in a movie or a TV show and fictional and then a uh, documentary? Um, for me, I mean, I never planned to be a, a documentary filmmaker in the, in the beginning. I wanted to, you know, I wanted to be like a third Cohen brother. I wanted to write mm-hmm. thrillers and, you know, kind of quirky, dark comedies. Um, but I noticed that, most of my storytelling was literally just retelling, you know, things that either I had witnessed or stories that my friends had told me, Uh you know, my, my friends might tell me a story and I see within it two or three other things that I thought were poignant or were funny. And I would, I learned that, you know, I could adapt things that had happened to other people and make them seem bigger or more spectacular or, pace them out in a different way and get a different effect out of it. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think when it's done well, like, you know, whenever anyone has an issue with, with storytelling, often when they say like, you know, they say something like game of Thrones is it, that it becomes too formulaic. The problem actually is that it's broken the formula because the formula, I mean, storytelling is at the end of the day, it's all math. Uh You, you're, trying to get a desired outcome so in order to do that you have to you know start with enough you have to start with enough things that build that outcome out so when you skip a step the formula becomes very apparent when you rush through it it becomes apparent but if you take the time and you you know do the necessary legwork to set up your you know your outcome then it all works well. And that's how, that's how life is. You know, life is cascading events and, uh, you know, cause and effect coming together often, you know, what seems circumstantial or, or, you know, happenstance to everyone else. Uh, to me, I might, I might see, you know, some metaphor within it and, you know, make the, the same just plain series of events seem like it's, more of a narrative style of story. Mm-hmm. You guys have any questions? Um, <clears throat> your, I, I, we talked a little bit yesterday. Your impression of Game of Thrones season is just that it was rushed. Yay? Yes? Yeah, it, it seemed very rushed. Um, you know, the, what was it, the, the episode with the, the, with the giant battle, mm-hmm. um, that seemed so meticulously planned and sort of well put together and spectacular. And it seemed almost like they forgot that they had to do the other episodes. Mm-hmm. Uh, like, it, it, like it could have just ended there. Yeah. It's, it's kind of like, uh, yeah, it's, it's kind of like, I think uh, it's almost like Dimitri Martin has a joke about uh, writing happy birthday on a, on a card and block letter lettering. He says, you know, everyone starts off with a big ass H and, you know, big ass A. And then they get to like the second P and they, they look and they realize that they're almost out of an envelope. <laughs> and so, the, you know, it's like big P, little P, and then squiggly Y. <laughs> and then they, you know, then they have to go write birthday underneath and they forget the lesson all over again and just start off with big ass B. That's kind of how it felt, you know, like you had this huge battle scene. Uh, and then even the episode before it, they're all just in the castle. It's like, that's fine if you've got, you know, 10 more episodes, maybe. Uh, but it was just, it was so much story packed into so little time. So little envelope. Yeah, so little envelope. And, you know, they made, it's like they made spelling mistakes along the way and just kind of quickly crossed it out. And we're like, well, fuck it. We've got to, we've got to end sometime. Yeah. So, uh, out of the West Side versus the World cast of characters, who would sit on the Iron Throne? This is the cheesiest question ever, but I'm going to ask it anyway. <laughs> who would sit on the Iron Throne? Yeah. Um, <laughs> in a in a way, it kind of. Um, I think West Side sort of, in a way, ends up much like Game of Thrones. I, I think that Louis is kind of brand. Uh, you know, he he's already is, brand. He's he's already brand. He's uh-huh. he's kind of broken and disinterested in most things. You know, he's he's beyond wanting. 
he's he's only concerned with you know the the task at hand yeah um there is no beginning no end you know time is a flat circle it just <laughs> it just continues until the lights go out one day um well, well, that's awesome. Well, tell everybody where they can find your movie and uh, tell them why it's important that they find your movie now as opposed to waiting for Netflix. <laughs> well, you can find it now on Amazon, iTunes, Google Play, uh, the Xbox Store, PlayStation, Vudu, a whole bunch of different places. If you're international, you can find it on Vimeo. So if you check the other platforms... Don't complain that it's not there yet. Just go to Vimeo. You can download it. You can rent it there. Um, and the big reason why you should download or rent it and pay for it is um, that that's how movies end up eventually on Netflix. And if you're a fan of, you know, the, the fitness space, the powerlifting space, there's nothing more powerful to help get other projects like this. You might hate Westside, and that's fine. You might hate geared lifting, and that's fine. Many people do. Um, and they talk to you all the time, I'm sure. Yeah, they, they tell me all the time how they don't like it. Um, and that's, that's great. But um, by the same token, to Hollywood, to L.A., to the people who finance movies, none of those divisions matter. All that matters is, is are people spending their hard-earned dollars on strength projects or not? If they are... You know, if this movie sells well, it'll end up on Netflix and then tons of people will see it and the whole powerlifting, you know, scene will expand many times over in the way that it has before when, you know, previous films like, uh, you know, Bigger, Stronger, Faster or, you know, to go all the way back to pre-streaming and everything to look at how the industry blew up when, you know, Pumping Iron came out. Right. But more importantly, other projects and projects by other filmmakers. This isn't just, you know, something for me, but other, you know, maybe there's someone out there who really desperately wants to make the next strength documentary that you want to see, but they can't get it financed because there is very little precedent uh, that movies like this can be profitable. So go ahead and, you know, if you know about it, if you've heard about it, if you're interested in it, Go spend a few bucks, go rent it on YouTube, go rent it on Vimeo, go pay for rental on iTunes or Amazon. Uh, if you if you think you're really going to like it, go buy it outright, you know, pick up the Blu-ray, whatever. Uh, but spend your dollars so that, you know, the, the men in suits and the powers that be see that there is a market for all this kind of stuff. Awesome. And it's worth investing in. Where can people find you? Uh, you can find me at Westside Film on Instagram and Facebook and Twitter if you're if you're one of those folks that tweets. Um, and otherwise, you can just you know catch me outside. There you go. All right, thanks a lot, Michael. Have a no good problem. one. No problem. You too. All right, Connor. Where can people find you if they're looking for you? At Connor O'Neill on He's, Instagram. He finally got a picture up. One picture. One selfie. One selfie. That's Wait, all I get. It's worth it. Ladies and gentlemen, Silent Mike, 2Ks, Instagram, Twitter, Twitch, YouTube. Be sure to uh, give us a rating review. Yep. Tell your freaking friends. Yep. Subscribe. We'll see you in the next one. I am at the Jim McD on all the social medias. The show is 50% facts, 4% is a word. And we'll catch you next week.